It's great to be with you. You know, I want to talk to you about this great book, The Real Rules of, of Life. You know, we've known each other for a long time, and, and I've read all your books and all. And this is obviously the most powerful one. Why? Because yeah. you had to really live this one. I mean, this is this has been a tough part of your life, living with Jenna's death and just realizing that, you know, uh, life is maybe not always fair and life is something that we got to realize. It's not a fairy tale, you know, the way we were taught, you know, everything, think good things and everything will work out well, you know. I mean, unfortunately, it doesn't always work out uh, no. that way. And, and that's what I think is so powerful about this book because a lot of people, you know, get down and disillusioned when life takes a turn and they just don't realize uh, that, uh, you know, that's just the way life is, you know. We're not given a... Saying, we're not given a handbook, are we, Ken? You know, for how no, to we got we no. got the handbook for Plan A. We write these beautiful handbooks. We've got these great designs and dreams, and uh, for our families, our businesses, our health, and uh, we we live as though it's all going to go on forever, and it doesn't. Um, sometimes it changes because of extraordinary things. There are miracles and unexpected surprises and uh, our, we look around and we can't believe that our lives have turned out as well as they have. But there are other times uh, like you're pointing out in my own life where we just can't believe it. We're sitting in the ashes of plan A and uh, we just can't believe what's happened. And somehow we have to summon the strength and the faith, the courage and the wisdom to go forward. And uh, we have to draw from uh, every possible source of strength and faith and understanding. And uh, when I looked at, you know, what's happened in the last 16 years of my life and uh, what, what is, what if I had to tell, say five things that I've done and that I, as I look around me, all the people that I've been able to help have done to pull themselves from the ashes and to turn their life back into a blessing, a gift to the world, as a matter of fact, to take that trip to the bottom of a pain and uh, have it be a life lesson of compassion uh, uh, and empathy for the suffering of other people and to really empower ourselves to live the kind of life that we really want, thats that was why I wrote the book. And sure. it's, it's that distilled essence. No, I mean, and that's just so important, you know. I mean, I experienced some of that when I lost my sister at 42. She was my hero. And I guess the toughest assignment I ever had was to fly to Florida and tell my mother that her daughter was dead. And, and uh, you know what I thought of is that one thing that's helped you and I, even with tough times, is that we play competitive athletics. And, you know, you do learn to, to, uh, to lose and get yourself up off the ground when somebody hits you. And, and I remember at Cornell, there was some brilliant guys. There was a guy on my floor had 800 in both of his college boards. Uh, you know, which is the ultimate score. He went to Bronx High School of Science, and and in the first round of preliminary examinations in engineering, he had like a 50 average, and he just couldn't deal with it. He ended up committing suicide. And uh, but uh, it is tough. People got to just realize that's why the power of this is that the real rules of life are life will have its messiness, and we really got to learn how to deal with it. The the, the article I. I mean, the chapter I love the most, <coughs> they're all good, is joy is a muscle. You know, that if you don't uh, work it, it, it uh, atrophies, it, right. it doesn't go. And so uh, uh, how do you, in the midst of things, still find some joy? You know, I mean, when we lost our house recently, 25 years in that house, and the realization, though, in the end was, uh, you know, nobody got hurt. And that That's was right. really, really fortunate. So it was just tough. Uh, but that could be a real blow to people, too. You know, Ken, you, you literally rose out of the ashes. And I remember going through that with you. And, uh, you know, we, we start looking around. There's a natural and understandable sorrow and deep sorrow for all that's been lost. And grief is as natural and normal as bleeding when you're cut. It's normal yes. for us to go through a period of grief and we need to get that sorrow out and to, to have full expression of that. 
then we look around and it's so important to be able to look at the blessings of what's still standing in our life, of the blessings that remain, and to look at the blessing that we had. Uh, you know, we, if we hold the expectation that we're somehow entitled or we're immune or we're exempt from everything that, that uh, everything that's part of the experience of being human, including getting older, including dying, you know, we're not, none of us get out of it alive. We're, we're none of us are exempt. So if we look at that and we start reframing the picture of life and our, suddenly our blessings, we're living into our blessings we're counting them, we're, we're nurturing them and taking care of the things that are precious and irreplaceable in our lives. And we're holding our despair and our broken heart right next to a full heart that's appreciating the gift that this life is and the blessing of the people in our lives and the opportunities that we've been given. And that's somehow, that's the core of resilience. That's the oh, core yeah. of faith. Yeah. That's the core of the courage, the raw courage that it takes for us to rise up again, create a new normal, a new life, you know, and it doesn't have to be a major thing. It could be a setback, a challenge, uh, or just a light bulb that goes off in our in our hearts that says, you know, it's time for me to make a change, a serious change in my life. So it doesn't have to be a tragedy. It could be just that timing in our life, and it may be time for us, something great to happen for us. Yes. And uh, you also are very honest in the book to say to people, you know, don't deny grief and don't, you know, try to act like you aren't really hurting because, you know, what you resist persists, as Warner Earhart always uh, said, and, and uh, but that rising out of it, you know, and I, I know how important Jenna was. I mean, such an amazing woman. I mean, the in fact, 3,000 kids came to her funeral at the University of Colorado as an undergrad. I mean, that just doesn't happen and all. But what I've seen as you've kind of got through your grief, how you've reached out to your daughter, Steffi, and how that relationship mm -hmm. just has blossomed and you've made such a difference in, in her life and as well as the ministry, you've reached out to not only help, you know, train women leaders, as Jenna was so interested in, but deal with other people going through grief, not to deny the grief, but helping them work through the process. Well, Ken, you know, it, it was a joy for me to be able to dedicate this book. And I know you're going to be there in a couple of weeks when we have our book party. And uh, I have, don't tell anybody, I have a beautiful plaque to Steffi with the yeah. dedication right in the middle to, I call my earth daughter and my angel daughter. And my yes. earth daughter, I dedicated this book to, but you're so right that, you know, we have a choice. We don't, we don't get to play God, but we do have a choice about what, what we do with what happens in this life. And we can either process our grief, allow it to somehow work through us mm -hmm. to understand that love is the flip side of sorrow and grief is love. And yes. to to allow that love, to allow the love to become the expression of our lives rather than the sorrow, the despair, and the cynicism. So we can process through our grief and process grief becomes love again. Unprocessed grief, the kind we numb and dull and stifle, or hide, deny, repress, and and avoid at all costs because it's too uncomfortable, that pro that unprocessed grief becomes more grief. It becomes, we don't, we become indifferent to the pain of other people. We become cynical and despairing. So we have to really take inventory where we are in that continuum. Are we processing our grief? Are we allowing ourselves the constructive and free expression of our sorrow? Or are we stifling it and trying to put a quick fix on it, trying to skip around it, uh, do something else other than what I think we're meant to do? You know, we have a digestive system to process through the things that we don't need for our future and to keep the nourishment. It's the same with our emotional system. It's yes. there. It's not to shoot the messenger of our emotions. It's there to help us process through and understand what we're feeling so we can get to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, denying grief isn't going to do you any good. I mean, it's, it's a reality of life. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, in 
it's just like saying adolescence is bad. That's just a stage kids go through. Well, grief is a stage that we go through legitimately when when we lo- lose somebody. And it, it's not about things, it's about people. Because as you well know, Ken, the important things in life are really come down to who you love and who loves you. And it's when somebody you love is taken from you that's really the toughest. And those are the ones we have to work our our way through. And uh, But that wasn't part of our plan of life. Life no. was supposed to be a bed of roses. But uh, but you know what it does, Ken? You know, what's, <laughs> and you and I have talked about this that losing somebody you love catapults us from our spirituality being the elective credit. It becomes the curriculum. Suddenly we need to know as parents, we need to know where's my kid? Where's my daughter? And you know, you and I had conversations after Jenna died and I said, Ken, help me understand where is Jenna? You know, where is this radiant light? Where does it go? Where is the spirit? And, you know, of course, today, Jenna is the, you know, chief angelic officer of the Jenna Drug Center of our foundation. And my spiritual relationship, it forced me to to have faith in those things that are unseen and unheard. But to know that my daughter is a living presence in my heart and in my life, as well as a guide was one of the most important things I've discovered in, in my life. Um, yeah. And I never would have pushed in so hard into, into my own unknowingness, yes. into my own faith, if it weren't for Jenna's death. Yes. So the dark gift that we sometimes have out of the life's worst losses is that it pushes us to the deepest level of understanding the true nature of this life and of death and of our yeah. existence, that we are truly uh, human beings, you know, having the spiritual experience or spiritual beings having the human. I think we're in the long run, spiritual beings having a, an interesting ride called being human. Yes. You know, and, and that whole concept of what happens to people, regardless of faith or not faith, I think uh, you and I both believe that when somebody's gone, They might be gone from their body, but that energy of who they are doesn't end. I mean, you know, I get messages from my mom and dad and my sister all the time, you know. I mean, almost as if they're they're here, you know. Yesterday was my dad's, would have been his 110th birthday. And I was just laughing because, you know, a number of times I could just kind of feel his energy and sort of saying, Ken, I'm not sure that's a really good move, you know, because he was an admiral in Navy and he was my kind of leadership mentor. And yes. he's still been a leadership mentor, even though he's been gone, yeah. you know, almost 40 years, my God. But that's, that's one, of the, one of the real rules of life is that our relationships don't end. You know, we're physically separated and we have the opportunity to reconnect, not only to reconnect on a whole different spiritual level, in another realm other than the three-dimensional one that we walk around in every day. But the second thing that, that we get to do is, besides that reconnection, is to live our lives as an expression of our love for these people, to embody the essence of, of the light that they brought to this life, everything they taught us, everything they embodied and mastered, and to bring it into our own lives as mastery. And uh, that's that's the gift that keeps giving. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for writing this book. I just think uh, uh, it's it's really your life in many ways in the last sixteen years. But I think uh, it was the the death of Jenna that took you to a whole different stage of life, which permitted you to write this book and share this book. You know, and and you couldn't have done it without that even though it was such a painful thing but now you can help other people realize that uh, you know pain is natural and sadness is natural but life needs to go on and uh, what are you going to make of it so thanks so much you're the best you're the best Ken I love you and I appreciate your your support uh, throughout the entire gestation period of this book and uh, you know you've midwifed how many books 
So uh, you've been a big brother and, and a, a great teacher and a great example for me of what it means to embody something in your heart and then give it to the world. So bless you and thank you. All righty. Take care. Bye-bye.